here. That, that it's clear how the mask is worn or not an outside or whatever. I'm not questioning mm -hmm. what. Mm -hmm. I, I get where Matt is coming from, but I also get that if you have, if a child has a sign of something that shows COVID, I believe the school district is doing the right thing of saying you need to get tested. The last thing I would hate, and I don't have any kids in the school district anymore. My last one graduated last year. But I would hate to see that the school district said, well, we're not going to start following if the signs are there, you know, and then there's a large outbreak. That would be terrible for the school district. So I think you're doing a good job on it. Thank you. Did you have? Yep, I'm just going to quick oh, go. Oh, Sam. Hey, Sam. Hey, hi. Um, yeah, no, I, I had a couple of questions um, and comments. I think one of the main um, things, you know, um, Matt, that you should take away, though, is the fact that we'll, the testing is going to start happening in school very shortly. So the days that these kids are sitting at home because they're being sent home, like because they have symptoms, but might not necessarily have COVID will be limited extremely by the fact that if they can just, okay, you're being sent home for having symptoms, but we're gonna give you a test before you go home, we'll most likely get those results tomorrow. You might, they, they'll most likely only be missing a day rather than, you know, getting sent home, have to make an appointment, get them to that appointment, you know, wait for, you know, the 24 plus hours to get the results. I mean, I think it's fantastic that we'll be able to be giving those tests to, to mitigate that issue. So um, I think that is a huge step and that not have in lessening the time our kids are not in school when they have a case of the sniffles. Um, so that's great. My other question, my question though, is regarding um, spectators and the winter sports. Is that, is that just meaning like open to the public in general or does that mean no, nobody at all, like, like parents can't come. That's correct, Sam. That means that there is no one but the two teams, coaches and refs, in games until we are able to review that before winter break. And that really is to be in line with, right now, no parents or volunteers are allowed in our buildings. Um, yeah. This has been a mitigation strategy that's really worked for us. Okay. Is there... Is there any, and I'm not disagreeing with the decision, I'm just wondering, is there any way that we can um, reach out with the local, um, like the local uh, Woodstock broadcasting to see if they could, um, they could video, like they could broadcast the games or something some way or have them on like Facebook Live or have them, it, on you know zoom live or some way so that the um so parents can still watch the games in some way yeah I guess, they're all being filmed yeah i was just going to say so last year with basketball i can speak from personal experience um you know having a high school doing basketball and they did have uh, a program that you would go online you could watch the live games at almost every school except for i think one which had to live stream on facebook or something um, oh okay or, great worked really well and I felt spoiled because um, as a parent, even though we're parents that go to all of our kids' sports games, it was really nice to have to drive to, to Bennington and come back and love the <laughs> Yeah, <closet>. yeah. No, <laughs> definitely. I'm just, I'm glad there'll be some way that, you know, um, we can still watch our, you know, our kids play their games. So that's, that's good. Awesome. Okay. Those are my questions and comments. Thanks. Thank you. So just quickly, there are some opportunities for professional development that I've listed in here with our leadership team. We went to Ithaca, New York to be able to see what it looks like in terms of racial equity practices. Um, also, we attended, some of us attended the New England Association of School Superintendents and Administrators, uh, as well as participating in some instructional leadership academy around coming to some agreements or shared vision on what the kind of teaching we want to see in our classrooms. And we're working with the University of Washington on that. And finally, I had an opportunity to meet with a math working group and we'll see 
quite a list of, of faculty that were involved in developing a map vision, mission, goals, and beginning strategies. And then we'll be coming to speak to the full board in January with the findings of that work. Great. Thank you, Sherry. All right, I think uh, Raph up next. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, three things that I want to highlight from uh, my report um, in the board book. Uh, first was the enrollment numbers, which we updated from last month. Um, so we added six students from when we reported last month. And um, we are also up uh, 21 students from last year. Um, but as you'll note, um, you may remember from our conversation last month, um, mostly these students are pre-K students. Um, so that those 21 additional students may not mean 21 additional ADM. We just certified our ADM fall submission uh, today, so we should be getting some numbers back from the AOE very, very soon um, about our fall ADM. Um, I also wanted to highlight and acknowledge uh, some work from uh, Jeff Bruce and uh, Eileen Vaughn around implementing uh, a new library software system in our elementary schools. Uh, so we're almost completing hey the process of... Uh, of completing um, an implementation of Follett. Um, so that's allowed us, will allow us to roll out audiobooks and eBooks um, to elementary school students across the district. Um, and so we will we hope to have that up and running uh, completely within the next month. And lastly, we are still waiting for equipment, um, which was ordered back in April. Um, so many of our projects haven't been completed yet at the middle school, high school. Great, thanks Ralph. Uh, does that include this outdoor Wi-Fi connection that I can <laughs> never get onto, Raph? <laughs> uh, yes, partially. Um, we, we have yeah. we have some Why outdoor Wi-Fi. It never works. It's not here yet. Okay, <laughs> on back order. <laughs> Thanks, Raph. Uh, Gina. Good evening, everyone. Um, just a few highlights from my department. Um, we're excited about uh, the rollout of our universal design for learning with Katie Novak, and we got overwhelming positive feedback around that professional development from our faculty and staff. And we were able to follow that up with our equity and EST coordinator and our data-driven recovery coordinators spending a day at each elementary school um, to help facilitate and work with uh, classroom teachers on this implementation, as well as um, presenting during uh, after school um, collaboration time on how all of our initiatives from, you know, working with Lavelle Brown, our late start days with Katie Novak, and the resources and tools that we've added to our district dashboard, how they all align and work together to help build and develop um, the supports that we need for our students. Um, we also are excited about um, working with the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium using grant funding um, so that we have a year-long action plan with them, one of which is starting focus groups. The focus groups will be students, parents, faculty, board members, and alumni as separate um, focus groups so that we can gain perspectives on critical issues related to equity within our district. Um, some special education highlights. Um, the OSAP, which is the US Department of Education, evaluates states, which then evaluates districts. And we, from the Vermont Department of AOE, um, were um, reviewed. And based on the performance plan and annual performance report, um, we met all of our requirements. So that's always nice to hear. Um, and then finally, um, I'm working with the Southeast Director Group on providing the Vermont AOE with um, feedback and um, targets related to the state targets that are used um, to analyze how we implement um, IDEA for special education. So those are some of the highlights of the work that we're doing, and I'll pass it over to Jen. Thanks, Gina. So I'm Jen Stainton. I'm the Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment. And I'm just going to take a quick minute to say hello to the new student faces here today. It's great to see all of you. Thank you for coming. 
Um, two in-house courses are being run at this time that align with our strategic plan in the category of student success. The first is called Math for All Learners with the All Learners Network, and it's a course that's helping to lay the groundwork for equitable mathematics practices that are being um, worked on by our district's math equity group. And the second is a course called With Literacy and Justice for All with Julie Brown, and this is the second time the course is running and supports the work of the district's Literacy Coherence Work Group. The Literacy Work Group met for the first time in October and began the process of coming to consensus on our district's goals, vision, and approaches to literacy, and this group will continue to meet monthly. Building our collective capacity for understanding and implementing our portrait of a graduate continues to be a focal point in our district. Uh, most recently, principals Aaron Sikwamani, Mary Guggenberger, and Garen Smale met with myself to begin the work of understanding how to create an assessment framework for our portrait of a graduate outcomes. And that work will also continue over the next several months. So I want to thank them for their work. And finally, some thank yous go out to our hardworking teachers who made our fall assessment window a success, and also for their engagement on Tuesday afternoon data collaboration facilitated by Patty Kelly, our data-driven recovery coordinator. Also, thanks. quick thanks to our pre-K and unified arts team. Uh, Jacqueline Porter, Jody LeBrun, Elaine Lively, and Lisa Kaya are facilitating some really meaningful professional learning for our teachers. And so I want to say thank you to them. That's it for me. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Sorry. Yeah. It's, it's November 1st. I haven't had a chance to do an in-depth review of October, but our spending seems to be on track. No surprises that I'm aware of. Um, the, we're in the process of compiling all the budget inputs from the principals. Um, Friday was the deadline for them to get their information to me. And now I'm putting it all together and so that I can have for the finance committee at, um, at our workshop in a couple of weeks a budget that we can work on um, as we uh, move forward. Um, I did give you a list of uh, the new positions that are being requested uh, for consideration in next year's budget. Uh, the elementary level world language teacher, which is one that was has been on the table for a couple of years and not made it into the budget yet. Uh, a pre-K paraprofessional at West, a marketing director, a grant writer, elementary level librarian and high school international relations coordinator and all of these will be vetted internally with our leadership team and with the finance team and i'm hoping that some will make it into the budget i am assuming they all won't uh, but that's part of the process um, i can tell you that i have um, health insurance increased rates for next year and the plan that most of our participants uh, participate in is looking at a 5.2 percent increase uh, which is the whole scope of health insurance increase is a reasonable increase and uh, so that's encouraging i'm reworking all my numbers in the budget because i started at seven and a half down to 5.2 and we'll see what that all looks like um, and because there's nothing else going on i'm working with our bus company to find out exactly what's going on with our contracts so that I can uh, bring a couple of ideas to finance committee at our next meeting about uh, bus contract and RFP and, and make some decisions on how we're gonna proceed with that. And our auditors will be here next week to do the audit on last year. That's it. So not much going on. <laughs> I have a question on that, but to you, Sherry, not to Jim. The elementary level world language teacher is there a specific language? So there was a plan that originated a few years ago that looked at K-3's world language of Spanish. Okay. Um, that's what was in place previously. What we've modeled of what would it take to return to that level? We didn't talk about a specific language. Okay. Um, the modeling that we've done is what would it take to return to the same level of uh, Back in the days I remember. Yeah. That was going to be my next question because we did go to like fourth, fifth, sixth. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if we were going back, looking to go back down to either K or first up. So thank you. Yeah, I can weigh in on that. What that, what that came from were discussions on the finance committee about potential priorities for the uh, FY23 uh, budget year. 
And so we were looking at some of the things that we got in years past considered. And one of the things that didn't make it into last year's budget was you know funding that K through three uh, Spanish education. Okay. Yes, kind of yeah. look at the cross for that. I'm all for it. Just so you know. Yeah. Ready to. Let's <laughs> <laughs> send the language to each other. I'm glad to be sitting next to Karen. On the language <laughs> parents. Thank, thank you all for those reports. Um, appreciate it. Next up, we have some students. I know we saw a couple, and I guess. Can I just, one second? I just. Yeah. Can I, in, um, what I realized, so one of the things that we wanted to do as the board is each month invite a special group to, to the board meeting just to have a, a range of perspectives. And I got a text, this, the only text was that we do have select board members tonight. I want to thank them for attending. It's a really critical time that as we talk about budget, budget priorities, and our forming of it, having select board members here and being partners in those conversations are really appreciated. Um, so I just want that to pass, and I think, thank you, Raina, for your work. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to introduce, we have Genevieve Morell, who is returning as a senior, and then we have two new student board reps that I'm very excited to add to our student representation. We have Aiden Kiovella, who is a freshman here, uh, has been in our district for a number of years. And then we also have um, Owen Corsi, who is new to our district, but has offered to be a member here. And so um, Genevieve has some things that she'd like to share. And I'm sure that Owen and Aiden will, in the future, if not tonight, have other things to share. Thank you, Sherry. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Genevieve Morrell, and I just wanted to share some things that I had as concerns. Um, the main thing I wanted to talk about today is um, mostly because I'm seeking the board's help with this is the behavior of the underclassmen this year. Um, I'm sure many of you know about the, the TikTok trend of stealing things from the bathroom, which caused a lot of disruption to the school and uh, many of the students as well, because we were then made to have um, bathroom passes and sign out sheets, was, which was a pain. Um, but it, it went beyond just the stealing things from the bathroom. I heard of many teachers expressing concerns about how they were being treated in the class and just general disrespect from the underclassmen. Um, personally, I think this is really shocking because I've never seen anything like this with any of the classes. Um, it's just really weird to see a collective class act like this um, and just have like a lack of respect for both the teachers and, and honestly just the school and their surroundings. Um, I asked some of my fellow students about it and I have some quotes from them. Uh, one student said, it makes me feel that the reputation that the under upperclassmen set for the school is being destroyed. Um, another said, they don't respect other students. And then another said, some students are even leaving the school grounds and going to buy food from farmer's market. Um, this last quote, I think, is really concerning to me because in my years in high school, I'd never even dream of leaving the school campus um, without obviously being allowed to. Um, I just, I find it really alarming that students are just getting up and leaving and going and getting food when they're not like remotely allowed to do that. Um, also, I think from like an administrative perspective, like it's unsafe as well because um, they could be doing other things when they're off school campus and we have no idea. Um, so I, I am just expressing the student body concern because, and I, well, kind of ironically, in both of my classes or two of my classes uh, today, it got brought up um, out of the blue. So I just, um, I asked some of my fellow students if they would give me some of their opinions. Um, but it's something that keeps being brought up among um, my fellow seniors. It's just, we're kind of flabbergasted by how these students are acting. 
Um, and I just, I want your guys' help because I really just don't know what to do because it's affecting me and I know it's affecting the teachers and it's affecting the school and it's affecting the, the groundskeepers who have to clean up the bathrooms and the soap that's all over the floor because people are ripping off the soap dispensers. So that's just what I have to say. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Genevieve. Uh, Owen, if you're still I might just unceremoniously butt in here. Um, thank you, Genevieve. I, I completely agree with everything you just said. Um, I think those are some phenomenal points, and it's a, it's a tremendously large issue, I think, that's pretty prevalent in our school at the moment. Um, also, just a little less concretely, um, I'm Owen, just saying hi. Uh, I'm excited to be here in Woodstock, excited to be at WHS and excited to be here. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, do you have a question or a comment for them? I do. Uh, Genevieve, how, because uh, I don't know quite how the schedule works for the under the, or the younger kids. How does it, um, how would they leave campus without anybody knowing? Like wouldn't they miss a class? And yeah, so I would assume their um, teacher would. <clears throat> the uh, the time that I actually saw it happening was when a group of students had been told that they could eat outside um, by a teacher that they were having lunch in their rooms because the students have lunch in a teacher's room that they have for fifth block. Um, so I know that happened. Um, I don't know if it's the same teacher every single time that's letting them eat outside, but somehow the students are ending up outside and then they can leave from the back, just from like the, um, the teacher parking lot. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure that... actually if they're skipping class either. Looks like you got Garen's attention. <laughs> I was going to say, Garen, okay. do you have any input on this? And then is the, um, is the other part is is the bathrooms are the bathrooms still being um yeah so the reason i yeah um the reason i think why uh it got brought up in class today is because there was um a, another soap dispenser ripped off the wall today that got handed to my science teacher um so she kind of mentioned that in our class um as far as I know, it's just happening in the boys' bathroom. Um, I haven't noticed anything in the girls' bathroom, but yeah. And is there a way to install, um, I know this would be a fine line, but like cameras on the, on the sinks or not? In, yeah, in I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't know what the school has for cameras. To begin I with, but, I mean, I obviously not here. the stalls, but yeah. So we're gonna, yeah, I, mean, I don't need that to come out of the first <laughs> Oh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not asking her, I'm just saying in general. <laughs> Sorry. We're asking for our help. So let's, let's real quick, I want to let, um, we have a few people with hands up. I want to let uh, Aiden pop in. Um, this is okay. Steve, and then, and uh, Adam, and then Garrett, if you want a chance to, to respond to anything, just raise your hand, let me know. Aiden, go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, my name is Aiden Kiovella. I'm a student at uh, the high school here, and it is an honor to be part of this meeting. Can you guys hear me all right? Or... Yeah, yeah. All right, awesome. And um, I just wanted to add to Genevieve, thank you for uh, what you said. Um, now, for me being closer to this age group of students who are doing these, I, can, I see it a lot like day to day, the um, situations with the bathrooms, I see the disrespect the teachers in the classroom. I hear like the talk, uh, especially like with my friends and kids in my group, my class like talking um, amongst each other about the situation, that information gets back to me and I can just understand more at like at that level of um, like kind of being right there um, how that's affecting other kids 
in the same class as these kids who are committing um, such awful actions. And it is really devastating, honestly, to see that um, students at that age are um, acting this way and treating school property, teachers' property this way. And um, I've been hearing cases about uh, how teachers' property has been stolen, how um, there is some vandalization in the uh, greenhouse. And I feel like it's really not only affecting like just the school as whole, but it's also can create a very like unsafe, uncomfortable learning experience that may be tough to uh, build around. So I believe that like there, I believe that we can't find situations to this problem. Um, but I feel like we haven't quite discovered who is causing like the roots, if it's a group of people or if it's a singular person. And I think that's maybe where we can start. Okay, thank you. Uh, Adam. Yeah, uh, so I think these are um, really um, important issues and I appreciate you know, you're all bringing these up. Um, I think that they all really need to be directed to Mr. Smale. Um, it's not necessarily appropriate at our level at a board to be dealing with um, really disciplinary issues or issues around kind of school school rules or them not being followed. Um, I don't want to minimize, you know, what your frustrations are, but I think um, me as a board member who's not ever present on the high school and um, couldn't tell you the rules if you asked me um, is not really the right person to kind of be able to have support you at this point. I think Mr. Smale, the school administration is really um, the best use of time to, to deal with something like this, guys. Um, thank you, Adam. Um, I just think that the reason I wanted to bring it to you guys is just, I think it feels like it's become a whole school problem and it feels a little bit bigger than just like some students acting out. Um, so I guess I just, I wanted to get some, a, a broad range of opinions, yeah. Appreciate that, um, Josh, and then Bill, and then we'll, we'll move on. So I guess my question is just, uh, how is this occurring at the school? Um, you look at, you know, from my line of work, working around state buildings, we don't end up with things like this happening, you know, to be frank, at a jail. So how are they happening at a school? How are these attached to the wall? How is this, you know, process happening to begin with? I don't think that's an answer we're gonna we're gonna get tonight. I mean that's something if we um, again if, if administration wants to either chime in or come back later on and, and discuss what steps are being taken, then that's that's fine. But I don't think that's a, that's a Karen, do you want to respond? Yeah, I don't. I, I agree with you, Adam. I, I think it's a proper time to weigh into the specifics of things. But where I really appreciate this issue being raised is it's helping people understand the massive adjustment that's going on. I think it was really un, unanticipated a lot of ways. We thought back in July, masks are off, we're going back to school, and, and really in the spirit of that. And we're realizing from a range of things from, um, you know, what is institutional memories about how we operate and how we behave to experiences people had from having much more autonomy during hybrid times and coming back into the more controlled environment of school. So what I appreciate um, Genevieve and, and Owen and Aiden bringing it up for the board is just to appreciate that that transition that's going on. It's really impacting uh, staff, students um, across the board as far as we're getting to this place. So I think it keeps, again, it's in Sherry's report too, just like this is this is some of the unanticipated impacts of, of still being in this COVID era in this place. Um, as far as the specifics, as far as you know, what do we do and work on it? Yeah, um, Bryce, I'd appreciate um, maybe time to come back and, and give a more thorough report to the board rather than just doing it ad hoc at this time. Thanks. Yep. Absolutely, thank you, Gary. Thank you, students. Genevieve, did you have any other topics that you wanted to hit before I? Um, yeah, I, this is, I didn't really prepare this one, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the committee that's being formed about changing the mascot. Um, I don't know if that's something that all of you are aware of, but um, at the leadership summit that happened um, in the middle of September, there was discussion about how we need to change the mascot because of um, what it represents. Um, so I just wanted to 
let you know uh, about that. And hopefully we'll be meeting soon to talk about that. And I was wondering if there is budget related questions about how we can maybe change signs and stuff, but um, that's just something I feel strongly about that needs to be changed. And I just wanted to put that out there. I don't really have any questions necessarily, but that's just something that will happen hopefully in the near future. Great. Bryce, I will be giving an update about that at the committee report time. Okay, great, thank you. All right, thank you all. All right, from that, we're gonna move on to some time scheduled discussions. First up is to accept a couple of retirements, and I believe we have a couple of board members here that are gonna speak. Who wants to start? Let's let Bob go first. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, uh, yeah, me? Okay. Yes. Um, I'd like to say a few words about Rob Hansen. Um, I had the privilege of sending my two boys to the Pomfret School, including Rob's tutelage during his 21 years of service to our district. And I got to say, he was way ahead of his time. With the advent of the Pomfret School or the, the Prosper Valley School, now emphasizing uh, environmental education and outdoor learning programs. 12 to 15 years ago, Rob Hansen was doing it. He, he embodied the, the philosophy that, uh, that says education doesn't happen at school, it happens where you are. And he took my boys and the rest of those kids out across the old bridge, <laughs> and probably even before the old bridge was there, right across the right. brook, and, and did it all, um, uh, teaching those kids so much about what's out there right in front of their eyes. So I really tip my hat to him for that. And then there's the Horizon Astronomy Program, which he single-handedly just about started uh, on his own, and... Um, created just a phenomenal opportunity to witness what, again, is right in front of our eyes overhead, uh, but that most kids in elementary school would never have the opportunity to, to, to see and learn in the kind of depth that, that Rob took to them. So as soon as the uh, naming uh, policy is, is set in stone. I'm probably going to put forward a, uh, a proposal to rename the Horizon Observatory to the Rob Hansen Horizon Observatory. My hat's off to him. Thanks, Bob. All right, Carrie? Yes, I'm going to speak about Jan uh, Winslow. Jan and I were colleagues for many, many years at Woodstock Union High School. Uh, when I think about Jan, the words that come to mind are gracious, patient, professional, high expectations for all, a leader, a colleague, and a caring person. But most importantly, I would use the word advocate. She was an advocate for the program that she ran with the special ed and still runs with the special education department. She brought students forward and she had high standards for all of her students. And I watched um, students really change and grow and become a wonderful school citizens in our community welcomed by all as she welcomed many guests and volunteers into her program as well. My fondest memories are working with her on the Zach's Place prom for several years and just the joy that she had to see her students reach success in many, many ways. She will be greatly missed at the high school. Thank you, Gary. Uh, it doesn't say on here, but I think we need a motion to accept the retirements, no? Yeah, I'm going to accept Rob's and just keep him around. So, so, <laughs> can, I, can I have a motion? I regretfully so, make a motion to accept these resignations. Second. Second. Anyone opposed? All right, motion passes. 
thank you to, to Jan and Rob, and uh, thank you to Bob and Carrie for speaking. All right. Uh, fall presentation data. Raph, back to you, I think. Yes, that is me. That All right. Um, so uh, I'd like to walk through some slides and give some information about our uh, 2021 uh, fall star data. Um, but before doing so, I just want to go through and make a couple of acknowledgments. I want to thank Jen Staten and Patty Kelly um, for helping gather and analyze this data and for all the principals uh, for their help and the teachers for their help um, overseeing and administering the star um, to all of our students this fall. Um, and lastly, I just want to acknowledge that COVID has had a large impact on student learning, um, both in our district and across the country. Um, and so that's an underlying theme through this presentation. So, uh, so we have some new board members. So I just wanted to quickly orient you to uh, what the STAR is. Um, so the STAR assessments are um, computer adapted assessments that we administer to students three times a year um, to measure their performance and growth in, in math and reading. Um, they're part of our local assessment system and they're not mandated by the agency of education. So what that means is that we control the configuration of STAR. We control um, when it's administered and, and the cut scores for uh, proficiency that we're looking to have. Um, in a lot of ways, it's a scrimmage before the game in terms of standardized testing. So in this case, the game is the SBAC testing that occurs at the end of the year, which is um, a summative public measure of, of our performance out by the Agency of Education. Like uh, every assessment system, uh, using STAR has uh, strengths and shortcomings. Um, STAR being computer adaptive allows the test to adjust the student's performance. Um, so this means that when students answer questions correctly, they, they get more difficult questions um, shortly thereafter. Um, it's a relatively short assessment, meaning that students um, aren't losing a lot of time for instruction. It takes about 20 to 40 minutes to administer either the STAR math or the STAR reading. Uh, it provides a, a norm reference score, in other words, a percentile rank. Um, and this is important for special ed eligibility and to see how a student's performance um, compares to a national cohort. And lastly, it provides us proficiency and growth data for each student. Um, some of the shortcomings of the STAR assessments uh, it is only one point of data. Um, and so it's best practice to understand that we need to have multiple points of data when we're assessing um, a student's understanding. The short assessments really have a, um, it's a double-edged sword. Um, we don't lose a lot of instruction time, but if a student is struggling um, on the STAR assessment, it doesn't necessarily, the STAR doesn't necessarily tell us why they're struggling. So occasionally uh, we'll have to do additional assessments in order to um, understand really where a student is struggling. Um, and lastly, the computer adapted, you know, adaptivity really makes it um, sometimes so that the, the scores will change rapidly. Um, and so sometimes if the student is really struggling and answers a number of questions incorrectly, their score may change um, quickly in, in ways that don't necessarily reflect their understandings. The last piece that I wanna show you before I'm showing you some of our fall data is this I, concepts of proficiency versus growth. Um, and so you'll see this quote here from one of the uh, Renaissance is the company that, that runs STAR uh, about the differences between um, proficiency and growth and that proficiency really being a destination whereas growth is the journey. Um, so here at the WCSU, the proficiency, um, we set proficiency at or above the 60th percentile on these tests. Um, and the reason we do that is because we want to have an assessment that is uh, predictive of a student's performance on the SBAC. So this is, but this is an internal measure for us. We, we, we choose the 60th percentile. Um, other districts can choose other cut scores and they, they may make their star scores look better in general, but may not, um, may lead to a disconnect between the SBAC and, and the star. Um, 
another piece about proficiency that doesn't tell us um, how close or far a student is from proficiency. So sometimes a student may be at the 61st percentile or maybe they're at the 59th, but that, that cut score just tells us that the percentage of students who are, who are meeting that goal. In terms of growth, um, the STAR has a unique measure for calculating growth, which is the student growth percentile. Um, and, and what that does is it allows us, uh, it allows students to be compared to a group of academic peers nationwide um, who've had similar scores on, on STAR assessments. And the advantage of this is that it allows us to measure growth for all of our students, um, regardless of whether they are struggling or, or high achieving. And ultimately, our, growth, our goal is to have all of our students um, with an SGP of greater than 50. Um, that would mean that all of our students would be growing at a rate that is faster um, than their uh, a cohort of peers nationwide. So I um, have four slides to show you, um, two about math and then two about reading. Um, so we'll start with some of our data um, around math. So what we're seeing here is star math, um, the percentages of third through 10th grade students who are above the 60th percentile. Um, on the vertical axis here, we have the percentages. Um, on the horizontal axis, we have schools that are grouped. So on the left, we have Barnard Academy. Next is Killington Elementary School, Reading Elementary School in the middle, the Prosper Valley School, West than the middle school, high school. You'll notice we have uh, different bars uh, with different colors here. Um, they represent different testing administrations. So the blue bar um, is from the fall of 2019. The orange is from the fall of 2020. And the gray is from uh, this fall, the fall of 2021. You'll notice that Reading Elementary School only has uh, one point of data. And that is because um, to be compliant with FERPA, we follow the AOE's guidelines um, on the minimum number of students uh, for reporting. And in this case, that's a cohort of 10. So this is the first time in these three years that we've had a cohort of 10 at Reading or 10 or more that we can report on. Um, you also notice that the Prosper Valley School only has one point of data, and that's because the school just reopened again. Um, and so many of the students who are at the Prosper Valley School were attending West last year. And that leads me into one of the major limitations of this, this particular data set is that um, we have each year we have different groups of students in each of the schools. So some of the variations that you see from year to year within the same school um, may be due to the fact that different students some different students are being tested every year. Um, so in terms of what we see in this data, um, we see that this fall, uh, Barnard Academy had the highest percentage of students above the 60th percentile um, to date. Um, but we also see that at uh, KES and WES, um, they had the lowest percentages of students above the 60th percentile um, to date. And this fall at the middle school, high school, the percentage of students scoring above the 60th percentile was slightly higher than um, the fall of last year. Moving on to the next slide, I'm looking now at star math again, but now we're looking at some growth data. Um, so this is the percentage of fourth through 10th grade students making adequate growth on the star math assessment. So you may notice the difference here between the last slide, we were looking at third through 10th, and then now we're looking at fourth through 10th. Um, the reason for that is, is that in order to evaluate growth, we need to have two data points to look at. So our current third graders don't have any data from the previous year, so we're looking at our fourth. Um, so we know from the star that, um, that any Student, it is possible for all students to have an SGP above 50, and that should ultimately be our goal. So we want more, the highest percentage as possible of students who are, who are growing at a rate faster than their national peers. Um, so we have uh, on the vertical axis here, we have percentages again, and then we have uh, the, the schools again grouped on the horizontal axis. Um, the colored bars here represent different administrations, um, but you'll notice that there are some little differences here 
Um, the blue bar represents the winter of 2019-20. That is because that's the first year that we administered STAR district-wide. And in order to have growth, we need two points of data, and we didn't get two points of data until the winter. Uh, the orange bar represents uh, the fall of 2020, and then the gray bar represents the most recent administration, the fall of 2021. Uh, you also notice that there's no Reading Elementary School um, data listed here, um, and that's because we did not have, if we take out the third graders, our, our cohort falls below the number 10, so that's under the, the guidance for the AOE for releasing these results publicly. Um, Rob, can I just confirm though that like the fourth grader, the, sorry, the fifth and the sixth graders from Reading are being represented. They're just not under the Reading Elementary School. Correct. Yes, these are just the students who are in the buildings. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Rob, can I just ask one question? I thought you said we need three administrations to look at the growth, but we've got TPVS here. And on your previous slide, we had TPVS, but that was the only year we administered it there. Can you just bridge that gap real quick? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so in, in that case, um, we have students, the TBVS students, their uh, prior data is coming from their previous school. So, so in that case, they're coming from West. So we have a point of comparison. And so it follows the student along, which is one of the advantages of the system. We can track it um, as students move from school to school. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Great questions. Um, so at all the schools where we have um, comparison data from the fall of, of 2020, we see that um, students are showing uh, more, more students are showing adequate growth um, than they did uh, the prior year. Um, at KES West in the middle school, high school, um, more students are showing adequate growth than the, uh, the winter of 2019, which was the pre-pandemic time. Um, so, these, this growth number, these growth numbers are very encouraging. Um, however, it's really important to note that Renaissance reported a large decrease in performance nationwide for students last year. And so it is possible that some of our increases in growth are due to nationwide decreases in star scores. So if, if the nation is as a whole, the scores are going down, it, it, it will be easier to achieve higher growth levels. Um, moving on to reading, um, so this is star reading, um, the percentage of third through 10th grade students um, who are above the 60th percentile in star reading. Um, similarly organized to the math, so we have our percentage on the vertical axis, we have our our schools organized on the horizontal axis. Um, we have some different colors just to, to keep it clear which ones are reading, which ones are math. Um, so the yellow is the fall of 2019, the green is the fall of 2020, and the gray is the fall of 2021. Um, again, RES and TPVS only have one data point um, due to those limitations that we mentioned before. Um, so for schools that have comparison data, the fall of 2021, the percentage of students above the 60th percentile was equal to or higher than the fall of um, 2020. And for Barnard and Killington Elementary School students, the fall, this fall, um, the percentages were the highest percentages to date um, um, in terms of the percentages of students who are above the 60th percentile. And the last data slide, um, this is our star reading, and these are the percentages of fourth through 10th grade students um, with adequate growth being an SGP above 50. All right. um, so organized the same way, we have our percentages on the vertical axis, we have our schools organized. Um, again, we don't have Reading included in the slide because uh, we don't have a large enough cohort because of the, um, the small number of fourth graders. Um, the, the, uh, each year is organized slightly differently here. So again, we have yellow being the winter of 2019-20 um, because the first time we administered it, the green being last fall, and then the gray being this fall. Um, so what we see, Barnard, um, Killington, with Cycle Elementary School students all have a higher percentage making adequate growth than at any previous test. Um, middle school, high school had slightly lower percentages of students making adequate growth in 21 compared to uh, 
2020. And again, Renaissance reported these um, nationwide decreases. So that could be part of why we see um, some of this growth um, being so large. So to summarize um, this data, uh, we see that the percentage of students um, achieving adequate growth is a relative strength within our data sets at this time. And it's something that we're, we're, we're excited by um, understanding that it could be due to nationwide decreases. But we also acknowledge that, acknowledge that we still have work to do um, in order to reach our high goal of proficiency for all students. So this is not done yet. We, we really want to see those proficiency numbers um, increase across all of our schools in both reading and math um, for our students. Um, so to talk a little bit about what's impacting student growth, um, we, we met with uh, the principals. And so I'd like to hand it off to, to, to Maggie Mills to talk through a little bit about what's impacting student growth. Thanks, Raph. Hi, I'm Maggie Mills. I'm principal at Woodstock Elementary School. And I was part of the team of principals and school leaders who looked at this data this fall to discuss what we have in place that might be um, impacting our students' growth. Um, and I would say that an overarching theme is that our district really embraces the concept of continuous improvement. Um, we often couch things with that phrase, we're still in a pandemic, but despite that we're still in a pandemic, I would say that um, this district really has not let off the gas in terms of um, using all the tools we have at our disposal and continually looking at what Uh, I lost her. We can't hear you, Maggie. She's, she's doing a lovely job. <clears throat> Give her just a second and see if she comes back. <clears throat> I wonder if she's still talking. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Hello? Oh, yeah, you look like you're back. We lost her for. Okay. Sorry about that. I live in the woods. <laughs> so I was saying that um, our district has continued to refine our assessment calendar and um, our faculty has learned some new assessments in recent years. This year we um, have all the elementary staff trained on the Dibbles, which is a phonics assessment. We have um, a new math screener for the primary level. So we're using more precise data and continuing to hone our data literacy to be able to talk about this data and target students who are not where we want them to be. Um, at the end of the year, our instructional time was back to nearly full time and we're all back to full time instruction. And um, there's been some schedule changes at the high school too to increase instructional time. We have um, really prioritized collaboration time. Our faculty are getting to collaborate every other Tuesday at that faculty meeting time. Um, and I know that principals are really mindful about setting up their, their weekly schedules to, to maximize the time where faculty can collaborate and talk with specialists and special educators and interventionists about how best to target um, the students based on the data that they're collecting. Um, Jen Staten referenced earlier this concept also of the simple view of reading. Um, we have more educators taking the course with Julia Brown to um, deepen their understanding of what um, really thorough reading instruction looks like. And part of that is um, increasing our, our focus at the primary level on phonics and phonemic instruction and ensuring that um, all of our primary educators are using foundations, which is our word study program um, with fidelity on a, on a daily basis to, to uh, ensure that students are leaving the elementary level with really strong um, decoding skills. In math, we've been using the All Learner Net Network resources to focus on the high leverage concepts and um, ensure that the scope and sequence of math instruction throughout the year is, is targeted at the most key points that students need to take away from each grade level. And um, our teachers are becoming more familiar with the Bridges to Math Intervention Curriculum as well. I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Mary Guggenberger, to talk more about what's in the works this year. Okay, so in addition to everything that Maggie has just said, um, 
what we continue to do to uh, improve practice and to ensure that students are given every opportunity to learn is um, keeping kids in school. We know that in-person instruction is the best instruction and um, we're really happy to hear about the test to stay um, programs and the, the at-home PCR tests and the in-school PCR tests that'll be coming up and uh, excited that this will help to alleviate quarantining if necessary. So um, that is one thing that's in the works. So you keep the kids in school um, committed to filling uh, vacant positions in coaching and intervention because we do know, I, I, I know at Killington, um, there are valuable personnel that work directly with our gen ed teachers to make sure that all students have access to core instruction, which is another piece that, that we're working on, on those delayed start Wednesdays. Um, those two hours are, are jam packed with universal design for learning or UDL to make sure that every student um, has opportunity and access to core instruction and intervention. And, um, you know, that this is just one piece to help improve practice and to identify areas where we can all use a little, little bit of support. Um, and then there is a math group, an, an equity math group. I believe there's also a literacy math uh, literacy group coming on online here um, that is really going to help with uh, curriculum alignment, assessment alignment, and making sure that we do have all those on ramps for every student and um, keeping that portrait of a graduate really close uh, to everything that we do and to align the strategic plan goals to fulfilling that portrait of a graduate. So that is what we have in the works. All right. So if we have any questions for... Um, I think there's more. Is there more? Yeah, Ralph. No, nope, that's it. I, I think that's the last slide, yeah. yeah. Any questions for, oh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, so thanks for the data. It's really uh, good to see. Raph, I was wondering if you could take the first two slides uh, that you did, the one you did for math and the one you did for literacy and just group them by, um, not now, but just as a follow-up, right? Just group it by kind of the elementary school kids and the middle high school kids so we can just see how that breaks out and where we are uh, as a community of elementary school students. That would just be an interesting data point to see where that shakes out um, for both. And then when we look at the SGP, which is the growth percentage, if I'm not mistaken, do we can we slice that data again to look at which students are growing um, at different rates, right? So where they cut, where the students fall across the spectrum of students that we educate in the district to say that this cohort is growing faster than that cohort, or if they're high achievers in the classroom, are they growing, are they driving that 61%, for example, at TPVS, just to, to take a number here off the page, right? Are they, what's pushing that 61% higher? Is there a certain group of students that's doing it? And are we leaving a group of students behind if the data can tell us that? Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Um, and, and yeah, thanks, Bill. Those are great questions. We, we definitely can group it by elementary school and, and middle school, high school all together. And um, we can as well use the SGP to kind of slice the data, like you said, in some different ways. Um, Star and Renaissance do that um, to, to sort of, uh, one of the things that they immediately do, and there are some reports uh, in the system that help um, teachers look at this, are, are, are to look at it in terms of Students who are high achieving, are, are they also growing? Or do they also have high growth? And, and students who are, who, are, who are struggling right now, where is their growth level? And, and so right. I know that's been part of the conversations that um, teachers have been having in order to see, um, you know, if, if we have a group of, if there are students in that low growth and low achievement area, those are obviously really, really concerning um, because they're, 
they, they've got a long way to go in order to make up um, and, and to get caught up with their peers. And likewise, if we have students who are in, in the high, high achievement area, but they have low growth, um, we want to make sure that they continue to grow at, at an adequate rate so that they, they don't end up slipping down below that cut point, that they, that, that right. they continue to grow well. Yeah, that would just be great data to see at some point, Raf. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, uh, Ben. Yeah, I, um, just first an observation. I, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting traction with the starting point being the 60th percentile, right? That's a comparative measure versus an objective measure. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I'm sure there were good reasons for for picking that, but I think about like our proficiency-based grading and trying to make sure that our kids are at a very uh, defined level of achievement. And then when it comes time to measure them on the star data, we're looking at uh, relative things. So I'm struggling with that a little bit, but obviously all things you know, being equal, you can, you can still see the trends. Um, I wanna speak a little bit about uh, the, uh, the pandemic and what we've heard tonight about there being negative impacts of the pandemic. Uh, from a funding standpoint, we got a lot of federal funding. We got these ESSER funds that are you know, being deployed for the purpose of making up for lost learning. And it looks like um, that is working. I guess I would invite anybody um, from Raf, uh, your team, or Sherry to weigh in on uh, whether we're starting to see some of the impacts of that ESSER funding come through, if, if that's what's being reflected in the data, or if there are any perspectives on that. I think it's still early. I think that, for example, our multi tier systems of support, we're having a lot of educational support team meetings around students' individual needs. Um, the data helps us have those informed discussions and then determine what is the intervention that we're going to be using. So those are some of the resources we did, you know, we added a data recovery coordinator, we added an EST equity coordinator. They're the ones that are helping us to organize the professional development, bring those opportunities in. Um, I think many of the things that you saw with, uh, Maggie and Mary talk about are pieces that we're investing in. The, the math equity group, where are there some resources that will help make that strategic plan happen? Are there, you know, one idea is how do we get people trained? Do we have a teacher lead, uh, training summit in the gym? You know, and do we pay teachers to come in? And so those are the conversations we're having. There's great thinking going on. At the same time, I've got to be really careful with my faculty. They are really tapped out. And, and while they want to do the, and, I, and again, hearing from them last week, they want to do the best job possible. They want to be part of every group. They just, and they feel badly if they're not doing all these pieces, but they're just so exhausted. Right. So we're really looking at the, the invest, like really identifying what those investments of time are, and then how do we support it? Doing the extra work, trying to do it in the summertime, rather than trying to add it on top of we're running a class from now on COVID. So I think we're seeing beginnings of that and I see future potential. And what's great about Esther is we've got it till 2023. Jim and I are being really frugal on how we use it. Uh, you know, we bought some furniture and some you know pieces in the buildings, but now we're really thinking about what can we do that have the longest impact to make sure we hit those right. expectations. Yeah, it's, it's really good to hear. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Raph. This is great data. And I guess I would just encourage uh, the team to kind of keep looking for those insights because at the end of the day, it's all about people and ideas and making those smart investments. So let's, uh, let's keep the uh, keep thinking going. Great, thank you. Thank you all so much for that presentation. That was great. Um, next up, uh, update on visioning. We have a couple of principals here, including Maggie, who is just talking to us. Um, Aaron or Maggie, I'm not sure who wants to, to kick off. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Is this, sorry, couldn't quite hear. Is this the time? Is this my time? Yes. <laughs> All right, great. And I'm not so sure if um, Maggie's and my slides are available to you up on the screen there or not. Should I share my screen? Is... Yes. Okay, give me just a brief <laughs> second here. Almost there. How's that? Can you see the Prosper Valley School Identity and Principles? Yep, perfect. All right, very good. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Aaron Sinkimani. I'm the principal here at the Prosper Valley School. 
Um, the Prosper Valley teachers and I started this process in uh, early August this year. As, as you know, uh, the Prosper Valley School was reopened and it was an opportunity to uh, re-envision, reopen and reimagine uh, what we might be able to provide uh, the students in our community. So uh, just a quick analogy uh, between uh, mission and vision creating and orienteering. Uh, here, I hope you can see this compass. Uh, well, you can't because you're looking at the screen. I can't do two things at once. My apologies. But ultimately, uh, good orienteers use the compass and a map uh, to navigate. And uh, goal, uh, mission and vision setting is, is very similar in that we need to create a tool that we can use similar to a compass uh, that works very closely with the map so that we can uh, navigate our journey together. Uh, so essentially our goal while mission and vision creating was to ensure that we had an embedded mechanism for ongoing reflection so we could continuously evolve and improve. Uh, this led us to creating uh, identity and identity and supporting principles. And we primarily did this um, by consistently asking ourselves how we will know when we live up to who we say we are and what we say we believe. Uh, so I have a, a group of uh, veteran uh, teachers from around the district and beyond. Uh, we got together again uh, this summer. We reviewed uh, some examples, uh, both from the district and outside the district. And we spent many hours together uh, doing a, some brief common reads uh, and some brainstorming activities and protocols and we had created this identity statement the Prosper Valley School inspires joy and self-fulfillment by challenging the mind and encouraging the heart. And these foundational principles that we believe in, uh, learning that is immersed in our community and environment locally and globally. We believe in problem solving dispositions that encourage strength, effort and growth. And we believe in striving for a just community that includes and celebrates diversity through fostering social awareness and advocacy. Uh, you should likely recognize some of the language and phrasing uh, in this identity statement of foundational principles. Um, some of the work that inspired this comes from uh, the district's portrait of a graduate as well as the strategic plan. Uh, let's see. And how do I change slides? Oh, we lost it. There we go. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. I'm not sure. Uh, from that, we were able to work with the local printing company and uh, make this come alive and these wonderful banners that are in all of our learning spaces at the Prosper Valley School. Uh, but kind of getting back to the analogy, how do we know when we realize our identity? Uh, we had long discussions on this, uh, but essentially we wanted a tool to measure our effect, the effectiveness of our programming, which is designed to guide all of us, which includes staff and students, toward realizing our identity and principles. And we identified about four or five ways in which we would do this. Uh, explicitly refer to these principles with students and making connections to everything we do. Uh, recognize and celebrate when students express or model any of these principles. Document when a student asks for more, more of something uh, that we offer document when a student expresses or models any of our values, uh, our principal or supporting, uh, supporting values. And by asking each other regularly, how are the children? Um, so simply put, um, as you can see here, we want to capture what the children do and say while they grow and learn through their experiences at our school related to who we are, our identity and what we believe our principles and be prepared to share that out at the beginning of our staff meetings when we ask, how are the children? The children are well, uh, and often in whole school assemblies. Without getting too deep into the Maasai people uh, of East, uh, East Africa, I learned years ago, um, there's some colleagues here in the district that are also aware of this, um, that this particular um, group of people in Africa like we do in the United States, we ask, how are you today? Good morning, how's it going? Uh, these people specifically ask, how are the children? That's their normal greeting. And the answer is, 
the children are well as an indication of how they are working together as a community and a society together for the greater good. So just taking that from these very wise uh, people of Africa and using that in our work. Uh, but ultimately here are, here are the children are well, and here they are uh, up on, on top of the mountain here. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had a uh, star throwers for three days. We spent our time outside, uh, whether that's outside or indoors, engaging uh, with owl pellets here, it's a science experiment, uh, students building relationships and using uh, the materials of nature to build forts, uh, all the way to working hard and playing hard uh, and a little bit of a healthy activity that the students earn at the end of the week. Uh, so the children at the Prosper Valley School are well. And then of course, any uh, nature art uh, engaging the mind and the body and the soul. So ultimately in this way, we've chosen to collectively reflect to continually improve. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Maggie? Maggie, are you all set to present your good? Can you see there or no? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. Put Great. It Pardon? Do you want to put it in presentation mode? Um, yes. Okay. So similar to Aaron, this summer, um, Woodstock Elementary engaged in some mission and vision um, work. And it started this spring. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why now for Wes. And um, the mission and vision that existed for Woodstock Elementary School was, was drafted in 2012 before I came to WES. And it was two really beautiful, all-encompassing paragraphs that nobody could remember. Um, and a lot has changed at WES since 2012. We folded in Prosper Valley School. We folded in Students for Reading. We went from being a K-6 school to a pre-K to 6 school. And this is our first year as a pre-K to four school. And um, this is our biggest class of, of preschoolers. We're now at 50 preschoolers. So our identity of who we are as a school has really shifted over the past um, you know, nine years since that, that last mission and vision was drafted. Um, and so it felt like coming out of sort of an intense year of, of really heavy focus on COVID um, and, and realizing that our identity was going to shift again with um, becoming a pre-K to four school, it felt like the right time to sort of address this question of who we are and who we want to be for for our students. Um, so we started with a faculty brainstorming process where, where we kind of collaborated online around these questions of who are we and who do we want to be for our students? What do we want to be known for? And these are some of the key words that came out of this brainstorming. Um, it was shared with parents in the summer um, and parents were asked to add on and give their sort of family input on these questions about who are we and what do we want our school to be known for? And so we took those ideas into consideration also and formed a, a summer work group of five um, faculty and staff members. And fortunately, three of us were at um, the school leadership retreat and had the opportunity to work with um, Louvelle Brown, the, the superintendent from Ithaca that um, Shari referenced earlier. And um, one of the big takeaways from working with Louvelle Brown was not only the importance of having a strong identity and mission and vision for your school district, but also that it should be something that really the whole community can embrace. And so this was the, the vision for the Ithaca School District. And those of us who worked with Dr. Brown were really inspired by this idea that um, you know, a really pithy, impactful um, vision should be what you're striving for. So their, their vision is Ithaca um, School District 6,000 thinkers. And um, we were really energized by this work with Dr. Brown going into our own work group. This was our work group this summer. We spent two days together at West, um, first really coming to some, con some consensus about what uh, a mission and vision were for, what those terms mean and what they're for, and then looking through lots of data about our school, lots of documents, um, 
surveys, um, staff surveys, student surveys, family surveys, all the brainstorming that had happened um, and coming together, uh, you know, with these various pieces to um, really land on a vision and mission for for West this summer. Um, so we came to the agreement that vision really means our school community's collective aspiration for our learners. And um, this concept of um, cultivating compassionate, empowered learners is really our springboard for our vision. Um, and for our mission, we came up with um, what we do as a school community to foster our vision. And our, our working mission is that the West community provides a strong foundation and fosters perseverance and belonging. And we really broke down what each of those concepts mean, what a strong foundation is, what perseverance is, and what belonging is. Um, and we put this out to the staff and the parents again for feedback at the end of the summer and, and this fall. And the feedback so far has been great. I think that people in our school community feel that they can really stand behind this mission and vision and that our school can is up to the task of, of living up to um, these embodying these traits. Um, so the work that we're engaged in now this year is working in faculty teams to come up with some non-negotiable core beliefs um, that will speak to kind of the day-to-day -day of what we do as a school to carry out um, the, the mission and really promote that vision of compassionate, empowered learners. So we've had some faculty um, work groups that have drafted out some um, core belief statements. We've met with back with our work group um, to review those and think about what's missing and, and how it ties into the portrait of a graduate and the equity work that's happening in the district this year. And we're really in sort of an iteration process for, for the rest of the year. We're gonna bring another draft of core beliefs back to the faculty in December and, and see if we can land on some, some consensus, consensus around um, the non-negotiables that we all believe and that our students and families believe. So it's exciting work and it's, it's really fun to be doing it at the same time as um, Aaron and his team are, are um, thinking about their identity um, so that we can sort of talk as leaders about what this is shaping up at our schools and, and what tools we're using to kind of assess where we're at in this process. So thank you for letting us share. Great. Thank you, Maggie. Any board members have any questions or comments for either of them? Yeah. Great work. Great. Yes, thank you so much. It's nice to hear about all this stuff, these presentations tonight about education before we get into the, the next categories, which uh, are more financial than, than others. So th thank you all very much for presenting that. It's great. Uh, next up, uh, just announce tuition rate. Jim or Ben, who's got it? Sure, I'm happy to start. Um, it's early yet to be announcing our tuition rates, but um, I started working on information, which I shared with them about 10 minutes ago, so we haven't had a chance to even look at it yet. Um, but I, I um, did an eight-year look back at tuition rates for our schools, and I did an eight-year comparative look back on high school and a four-year comparative look back on elementary schools of schools in the area. So we can see historically how we compare to our neighbors and how they're moving forward. Uh, that also has a worksheet that he used last year um, in the budget process. And he shared that with me. I've started updating it. Uh, and what I did in that worksheet to date is I did get as far down as putting in some comparisons if we add so much to each tuition rate, what it will do for us financially. Keep in mind that we have 25 elementary tuition students and 83 middle high school tuition students in our district. As of two weeks ago, I haven't updated this or asked new numbers. I don't know if they've changed since two weeks ago, but it's a pretty, those are pretty solid numbers at the moment for what we have for total um, tuition students in the district. And so a $250 increase or a $500 increase um, is not very shattering to our financial uh, 
well-being or income, but you did not raise your, your tuition rates last year. Most of our neighbors did. And so these are conversations that I'll be bringing to finance at the next finance committee meeting. So hopefully coming out of that, we will have a recommendation for uh, announced tuition rates for December, your December meeting for uh, the board to adopt. Right, and that's the uh, significance. We're really just teeing this up um, on the agenda tonight uh, in order to make a timely decision for um, FY23 uh, budget uh, processes. And just to, to anchor on the numbers, the uh, middle school, high school tuition, as Jim indicated, it was not uh, raised last year's uh, $18,500. And the elementary tuition, uh, we stayed the same at $16,000. So those are the kind of the baseline. They've been there for a while. And uh, board members who were on the board during last year's budget cycle may remember um, some pretty uh, intense discussions that we had around uh, raising that elementary school number and then ultimately we decided not to based on uh, kind of um, you know a, a target impact um, on, on, on one particular uh, community uh, who sends, sends kids to our, our schools. So. If Brandon did link the current FY21-22 um, tuition rates to the agenda so you can everybody can look and see what those are. Right so I think for the, uh, the December board meeting we'll likely We'll um, yeah, we'll, we'll go back to finance and we'll come back with a recommendation for what to do for FY20. And Jim's done a really deep analysis. We've never had this kind of crossover or look at where we are in comparison to our region. So thank you, Jim. This is really outstanding. You can't make informed decisions without the information. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to give you the information we need. <laughs> so since we're talking about information, let's go back to the uh, 2021 year, because I think that was the one main argument from, you know, it's Pittsfield, which is a big partner of ours. And there was a large increase, I think, in 19, uh, 2019 or 2021. So just just to keep that was raised, made, yeah. you know, yeah. I think we had a large increase that one year, and then he's like, it was a, he gives through the history. I don't know if we're on tonight, but you know, a, a, a series of increases, you know, leading yeah. up to that, it was kind of like, hey guys, where does it end? And we looked at that, and that was a little bit more information to make an informed decision. So I'm not, but yeah. you guys, I'm just, but something I'm like for on the elementary level, a five hundred dollar increase. It is $12,500 based on our 25 tuition students who aren't all from this field. So um, a $500 increase may sound significant, but $12,500 is all the general. Yeah, right. Yep. Great. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, Lock Public High School Choice. Got my name to be Gary. Gary, do you have any couple of points or am I gonna gonna wing it? <laughs> I think Bryce, uh, you and I were thinking the same thing, kind of like our names are both there. Um so as far as the Vermont School Choice, this is uh, the public school choice program that is statewide for Vermont high school students, where students can uh, make a request to attend uh, essentially any high school, public high school in the state. Um, and so the request works first with the setting school, uh, the school of residence saying, yes, it's okay to release this kid, and then coming to um, to the receiving school to see if, if the students admitted. Uh, we've gone, um, again, another data one, like Jim was just saying, different data, at what point does accepting students into our building kind of cost us money? And really the analysis we've looked at is if we had a, a real concentration in any one grade level. So let's say we had about 15 students in one grade level, that would probably lead to a cost where we have to look at increasing staff for that sort of impact. So what we've looked at over the years is what's a, a reasonable number that allows us to be participants in this program, which we're supposed to be, um, gives us a tool at our disposal, which allows us to bring students in from different places that enhances our student body in some ways um, and for other reasons. And so for the past few years, we've arrived at this number of accepting six students per year on the current piece that's in the packet, you can see that there are three students that are using this to attend our school. Um, and so I'd recommend keeping the number in the same place. I think we've looked at it in a few years and I would, I would recommend keeping it at this spot. Um, there's also the question on there, how many will a school allow to leave? Um, it's rare that we have that. I would say we probably have 
one student maybe every three to four years that asks to go to another school. Typically, it's something like a family moved into our district late in a student's career in high school and says, I want to stick with that the other school. Um, so again, I would stay, keep that number the same too. I think we have it at, maybe it says five on the message. So those are my recommendations, Bryce. Great. Um, right off, can I have a motion to keep the limit, the income and limit at six? So moved. Second. Uh, question. Yep. So, Karen, the current three attending, do they have any siblings that would push us all over the six? Um, no, I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Certainly not with two, and I don't believe with the third. That's a big difference. You don't believe or you know. That's that's. I mean, every year, that's my question. I just don't want to affect the family that has a student here already that might have twins that are coming up and then two other people have singles. That's, Great that's question, Jim. Yeah, so I would say we have three of six there. So we have some open slots. Um, we have some that are graduating. And I will say with confidence that two have no siblings that would affect it. I just don't know about the third. So okay. I, I think we do have space available. Okay, as long as you feel comfortable with that, I just, you know, that's my main concern. Right. No other conversation. Is anyone opposed to the motion? If not, that motion passes. Uh, can I get a motion? So you we're suggesting your, your recommendation, Garrett, is to not. We do not currently have an outgoing limit, correct? So your recommendation would to still not set an outgoing limit beyond what's already in the statute. Yes, I. That's what I recommend. Which would be five percent or fifteen. Right. So there's no need for a motion, right? Because it's statute. I think it's just good to get the maths. So yeah. moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Is anyone opposed to not setting a limit on uh, students beyond what's already in the statute? All right, that motion passes as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Garen. Um, next up, Buildings and Grounds Committee has a recommendation. Jim, Can you Jim. put the motion up on the screen? Oh, it's five F motion. Uh, plan on that, you got you. No. All right, I'm going to make a motion that the construction proposal from Johnson Controls Inc., a qualified energy service company submitted in response to the RFP of the district to implement energy and resource conservation measures at seven district owned facilities pursuant to an energy performance contract in the form as presented to this board at this meeting for an agreed price of $3,177,301, the contract be accepted and that the superintendent be hereby authorized to execute and deliver the contract and all necessary and appropriate related documents subject to such amendments to those documents as she deems warranted upon advice of legal counsel. And I get someone to- Second. Second. Ooh, and Jean's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> we all show them. <laughs> and I, I just want to say on this here, we, we, we did make this motion around two meetings ago, and we came into a um, situation where we had to put it out to others for an RFP just to have it completed. And this is exactly what that's saying. We did process and we're back at Johnson Controls. I think there was just one um, update to the package that was previously presented. Didn't the interest rate change a little bit, Jim? That's in the next part. I the, next part. Like, yeah. the interest rate did change, so when we get to that, I'll okay. yeah. yeah. All right, that's the next motion. Anybody, any questions on the motion on the table? All right, anybody opposed to the motion? That motion passes. So now I'm gonna move on to that. The board approved the resolution to enter into a 15 year lease purchase agreement with Signature Public Funding Corp in the amount of $3,177,301 and authorize the director of finance and operations 
to negotiate and sign all documents as required to complete this process. I hear a second? Second. And so this is um, where Jim will come in and start talking about the interest rate that Ben was just talking about. So we went out to bid for our financing when we thought everything was in place last August and had a really, really low interest rate. Um, the market's changed a little bit since then. Uh, we went out to bid again last week, but instead of putting it out to five different loan institutes like we did before, we went back to Signature, who was a little bitter last time, and said, what can you do for us? And they came back with a price that's 18 basis points higher than what we had before. Just so everybody knows what I'm talking about, there's 100 basis points in 1%. So it's 18 hundredths of a percent that it increased. We were at 2.23 the first time, I believe. Yep. So now just add the 0.18, so 3.41. 2 2.41. Right. And so um, it's still a really good rate. And I don't know that legally you need to do this. I would like you to just reconfirm this vote so that we have it in the right sequence and it will make legal counsel feel better. <laughs> and that's important. <laughs> And then I'd just like to say, going through this whole process for I don't know how many months, I'm looking at Terry and Matt. Years. Uh, <laughs> it's the interest rate part to me when it came down to it and Joe back here, it's, it's being backed mostly by the energy efficiency. So I really don't know how the interest rate fits into this because it's guaranteed with the, mm -hmm. with the savings. So to me, the formula, it, it, it doesn't, this is one time to me in my world, it's like the interest rate, it's tied to this energy efficiency part for going from 3.23 to 3.4, uh, 2.23 to 2.41. It's, we're not talking, we're really not talking anything here. We get back to Jim's uh, analogy on the $500 of students, about 12 grand. And maybe that's over 15 years. So, all right, uh, Bill. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Jim, um, if you could just um, touch on the, Right. This is all offset by the energy savings, correct? So in essence, it's almost a cashless transaction. Yes, we're borrowing money, but we're getting savings back to pay it back, or am I mistaken on that? So this, you're talking to Jim. I'm Jimmy. So. This, I'm talking to nice. Jimmy, right, and Jim. Uh, both of you. So I'll just go J squared. <laughs> this, this is mostly offset by energy savings. In our uh, financing package, there's about $89,000 that comes out of the budget each year uh, that is not offset. And that's mostly to pay for the control system that is overlaying all the buildings. And um, working with Jimmy and Joe, um, we determined that we were addressing so many of the capital needs of the district that are, were scheduled to happen over the next five years that we can afford to take this out of Joe's budget without impacting his ability to function and move forward with the upkeep of the buildings. So those of you that are new, the little joke here is that my name was always Jim, and then we had our finance director, and finance director trumps a board member. <laughs> I'll give him that. So I, I've gone back. I didn't say finance chair. So uh, I, I dropped down to my uh, grade school name of Jimmy. Uh, but Bill, to get back to your, uh, your question there, I put it this simply. All the energy savings are paying, we're paying $89,000 a year for a $3.177 million project. The rest of it is being funded by the efficiency of this project. I don't know where else you can beat that. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks. We have more to come. As long as the school board keeps playing. All right. Uh, <laughs> is anyone opposed to the motion on the floor? Thank you. No one's opposed that motion passes as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Jim and Jimmy and Joe, for all your work. Along and Terry and Matt and Sherry and Josh. The J Club. <laughs> all right, next up, FY23 expense budget discussion. 
Yeah, so we're into to budget season and uh, sharing on my uh, on the screen here for everybody, uh, something that should look familiar to those who went through this process last year, we kind of kept it the same. We're, uh, we're into November and so uh, early November, this is kind of what we're up to is, you know, looking at, um, you know, the enrollment numbers, RAF uh, is really encouraged to see that those are kind of coming in um, you know, similar in terms of raw numbers to what we looked at last year, it's a great trend uh, and it kind of gives us uh, some options if it, if it bears out. Um, but this is just kind of the big, the big picture in terms of, of where we are. The agenda item is uh, expense budget discussion. You heard uh, Jim Fenn talk earlier tonight about um, you know, collecting inputs from uh, the, the principals and uh, building the budget. And that's really the first step. Uh, and it's uh, when we when we kind of turn to the, uh, the the priorities or the excuse me the uh, the key factors and assumptions that we track. And this is an updated slide from the last board meeting. These are really kind of the big rocks in the budget that we keep we try to keep our eye on, right? And so last year we saw that that number and now this number is going to look different, excuse me, um, um, than what Rap presented earlier because um, it's equalized pupils, right? The, the number that we had last year um, kind of boils down through the state's formulas to, to something like 928. That's what, a reason that we had to kind of, but to kind of curb our enthusiasm with the number of preschoolers that we got. But um, the two things that are really kind of uh, coming through uh, as we kind of move through uh, the, the, the budget season here on the key factors that we're tracking, enrollment starting to kind of you know take shape, and then the health insurance number that was a great uh, you know, development that we, we saw come in this week. Uh, just for we were, we thought it was great last year that we that, that health insurance costs only went up you know 9.8% because the two prior years it was I think 18 and 12%, right? So that was kind of a blessing. So to have it come in at 5.2 is is really kind of unheard of, and that's that's great. Um, so I'm going to switch over. Uh, Jim also mentioned a uh, kind of a spreadsheet that, uh, that that I use, and this is something that uh, he's rebuilding um, uh, as we you know coming out of the last finance committee meeting. Um, but from an expense standpoint, you can see this is this is last year. This is just to give everybody an idea. Um, this expenditure portion of the budget, right, um, is is what we use for planning purposes. We essentially just take the the number. Uh, the total expenses from the, the prior year, and then start um, adding things to it. We'll, you see the, the developed line item budgets will come in later in the process, but this is just for planning purposes. Uh, and those big rocks that you see, um, last year, you know, we were reopening TPBS, so that was something that we were layering into our expense budget. Uh, but then uh, the uh, increase the healthcare costs last year, as you can see, we were looking at modeling um, you know, 10 to 15 percent. So that'll be a, you know, a blessing that you have something that won't have uh, as much of an impact as, as even last year. And then the uh, staff increases, uh, you know, increase to you know, cost of living and uh, performance based, you know, sorts of uh, decisions that the board makes about um, those members of, our, of the administration that we have uh, kind of control of the, of the uh, salaries. So that's the um, that's really the expenditure portion. Some more of the numbers from the uh, from the key factors and assumptions that will come into focus really uh, happen more on the um, on uh, the revenue side, right? So that's that's where the enrollment really comes into play. Um, and as you can see, um, you know some of the things that we we get from the state. Uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, we, were, we were just talking about tuition earlier in the meeting. You know, that, that plugs into your 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 revenues, but doesn't have huge impacts uh, to the point that uh, Jim was making. You know, even raising your your tuition a thousand bucks. You know, on say 25 kids. Last year we were thinking about doing it for 19 kids, right? It's not an astronomical amount of money in the grand scheme of things. But anyway, this is uh, the the finance committee had a pretty good uh, discussion about you know this spreadsheet. This is really kind of the basic blocking and tackling that you know kind of runs the financial aspect of the district, keeping an eye on these uh, developments as we go through the budget season, plugging them in here, and then at the end of the day, coming up with uh, tax rates that we can communicate out to the, the, the member uh, towns and uh, giving everybody an idea on what the expenditures at the school uh, district as compared to the revenues will we'll do to everybody's tax rates. So that's, that's where we are. This is last year's data, like I said, um, we'll get a, a first look at, at um, you know, the kind of refreshed version of this 
um, uh, at the next meeting, and we'll, we'll plug in some of the uh, some of those assumptions uh, based on these scenarios, worst expected, in best case. Uh, any questions? So, uh, Ben, where do we start working in the ESSA funds? Yes, yeah, so that's going to be on the revenue side, and I guess the, that's, that's grant funding. Uh, the thing about ESSA, and Sherry, keep me honest here, is that you can't replace any of the money that's in your, uh, your current budget, right? So it will likely um, kind of blow up the overall amount of the, uh, of the budget, but it's not going to uh, impact um, your education spend, right? And I can go over to the, the warning that we put out last year, right? You might remember. You know, we went to the taxpayers, but this is what made it in every town meeting, which here's the you know, the overall expenditure, and then there's a portion of it that you have to raise from taxes, or excuse me, uh, that you um, that you that you that boils down to you know your your per um, uh, per pupil spend, right? Such a tax rate. But the extra funds likely are aren't going to impact it because we're going to spend all the money that we get. No, I wasn't talking of talking about how are we going to show where we're spending that. You know, as Cherry spoke before about um, when Rock got into the whole um, scoring of the math and the reading, um, it's great to see a lot of stuff moving forward. But one of the things I didn't see really was like, it was more like preparing and getting staff ready to do. Um, to me, it's like, what are we doing? Are we going to use any ESSA funds to bring in some math um, software, some reading software? Right. And that's what I would like to see when we start doing this budget and what we're doing. One of the other things in the budget while you're talking about it, and now that I, I've been um, trying to get this for the last two years, and now that I don't have any students in the school anymore, I'm still very adamant about this. I believe that this school district should be saying that AP classes are for anyone and they are paid for by the district mm -hmm. and i think that really is a big selling point if you're going out i believe rutland actually had i've been told that they do um and i think that killing of uh, them woodstock middle school high school should have the same we should be it, 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 i know we have a program that if you're um not making x amount of dollars that you can have your ap you know, once again, I don't fit into that class, but I believe that every child should have the right to get the same education of anyone else and that they don't need to fill a piece of paper out. I don't care if your parents have a dollar or a hundred million dollars in a bank account. No one needs to say it. The school district pays for AP. And so in the ESSER 3, which is, hasn't been open yet, there is funding for that for this year. Okay. So I just... I would like to see that every year. Sure. Not when, you get, when you get it started on the federal time. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So then we can start seeing that. And also, the, um, what's the other test these kids are going for? The SATs. The SATs. Yeah, it's in there. So, so as long as we can get it in there this year on ASSER, but I really think we should be thinking about future making it that our school district will have this SAT and AP class paid for. So, and just to clarify, Sherry, is that for um, FY22 that it's going to be paid for? Because we're in the FY23 budget planning now. Right. The money for us is for this year, and so we, and again, we haven't, we haven't filled out all of SR3, and so we can plan about do we want to put an answer for next year as well, and then begin to build it with the budget. So I think that's the kind of conversation we should be having. Okay, we'll learn it out. Yeah, I'd be curious to see. The results. This being the first time you're offering this, and just I'll try in because I think I've supported Jim every year. He's, he said this, but I, I also agree. And I just think that if we're going to be able to get it done for free this year, um, you know, considering the future, it'll be interesting to see how many kids get the update. So, so when we when we're talking about that, the one year I did get this district to give the first AP paid for by the district. And it was not communicated well. Even my own daughter did not. She took like five AP and she didn't realize, oh wow, Dad, I got the first one paid for. It was not communicated well. <laughs> so if you're gonna do a sampling of how it is, let's make sure we spend some S money to right. so advertise I just, it. I just pulled up the spreadsheet. So what I did is I estimated the SAT AP cost for two years, which is $60,000. So these are the investment strategies that I've 
created to once the grant is open. So that's two, so it's 30,000 a year um, at this point in time. So I've put in for six. Well, I just want to make sure that we advertise it out to everybody correctly. Yep. You know, so how many how many students does the AP classes affect? I mean, are there? Um, I don't have a number off the top. I don't know if Darren's still on. Did you hear that? No, let me hear the number. What was the question? How how many students attend AP classes? Does the grant cover that? Yeah, how many students attend AP classes currently? Like I said, 50, I mean, is it? Right. So we administer, so about 160 tests are taken each year. Um, that's probably taken by about 90 students, would be my guess, by 160 tests of 90 students. And I, I do want to clarify, Jim, yeah, we did continue the one test per student this year. It was very clear. So on the sign-up sheet for all students, when they're signing up to take their AP test, it clearly indicates that test one is, is covered by the district. So, so thanks for that. That is well, well advertised this year. Since you said that, I just want to clarify. You said when they sign up for an AP class, it's clear. I want it to be clear before a person. So when they say, oh, that's saying someone can say, oh, I want to take the AP, but I don't have the money. My family Good. doesn't. They're only yeah. going to find out when they sign up. I want to step before that. That makes sense. Yeah, we can put that. I just want to clarify, there's no cost in taking the course. There's just a cost in taking the exam. Um, but we will we'll, we'll make sure that's that's good advice. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Bill? Uh, Anna? Yeah, I know uh, Ben has already taken down the spreadsheet, but I wanted to bring everybody's attention to the fact that um, Act 46 incentives um, have expired. And so this will be the first year that we don't have that um, um, lower rate on the taxes. So uh, last year was the last year and it was 0.02. Um, so that while you're looking at last year's uh, um, Excel sheet this year will not contain that 2% um, or two cents on the dollar, I believe is the official term uh, uh, for the incentive for our taxes. On the rate, yeah. And it's been decreasing, you know, eight year. cents, right? Uh, so we've been living with a, a diminishing amount every year, but we'll continue. This will be the last year that we take a bite. Yeah, I just wanted to put that on the radar of the school board and any public members that are here this evening, um, put that out on everybody's radar so it's not a surprise come 2022. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for that. Next up, uh, committee updates. Uh, Sarah, did I hear you say you were gonna speak to, to policy? Or do you want me to run with it? You're muted. So the only one that we have tonight, I believe, is the transportation policy. Yep, the transportation policy is up for adoption. The, the language is there. Um, I guess I'll point out, because it's not called out, um, it's the one, two, three, Fourth sentence that was added. Additionally, the superintendent shall have the authority to make exceptions to this policy under circumstances deemed to be exceptional as long as all safety requirements are met and the exceptions are authorized by the board. So that's that's a specific amendment. I'm just calling it out because this is not a full policy adoption as we've done in the past. It's just that adding that specific sentence. Um, so while we're kind of start talking about it, I'll make a motion to adopt. The transportation policy. Do I have a second? Second. No. Do you have a comment? Yeah. No. Well, can we call it? Right. I, I'm going I'm, I'm to um, take this rare occasion to make a comment myself. Um, I guess I have a question, and I'm sorry there's only two of you from the committee on the, on the call tonight. Um, I just wanted some clarification. Uh, is to whenever I see exceptions and it's it's tagged up with a term like exceptional or another descriptive word like that, I always feel like that um, is a lot of gray area. Uh, so because we haven't defined what exceptional is, uh, and I don't know if it's exceptional 
we're saying that we're putting something in the, the authority of the superintendent, but then the sentence ends by saying that it has to be authorized by the board. Um, so I was just hoping for a little clarity around maybe what your guys at least intent was. Um, exceptional. And then um, if we're offering the authority, should we also still have to have it approved by the board? Because I feel like it's, um, you know, kind of kind of going back and forth a little bit. Um, if either of you want to speak to that or... Sorry, I'm trying to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, it's OK. Um, can you tell me where I can't find that sentence? It's the fourth sentence of the policy. And they're pretty long sentences. So it starts with additionally, the superintendent. Four line up from the bottom of the first paragraph. Thank you. It goes district acceptance circumstances and then additionally. From the bottom up. And what you're looking at, I've brought this up with similar concern to other you know, policies or procedures. Whenever we have that kind of language, the uh, exceptional, extraordinary, those types of words, I always, um, I just hope that we can define that, I guess, a little bit. Mm. Hmm. And there's one reason I bring it up in this is because there's already exceptions under the ADA that, you know, that exist. So I, I was just trying to think to myself when I was reading it over and over, because we have some pretty pointed lines in here, um, what that exception might look like. There's already ones for disability, 504 plans, you know, things like that. So uh, I'm just not sure what else would, would qualify. And I just, so it doesn't have to be perfect. I just don't think you guys had a conversation around like, what you got, if there's any ideas thrown around, like, oh, what if this kind of, kind of thing so we can understand. Well, maybe there wasn't any conversation. Or maybe not, which is fine. Too. Now, if, if I could just jump in. Um, my understanding really was the intent was to just give the superintendent the discretion to respond directly to extraordinary circumstances should they arise. We didn't have pointed discussions about examples of those things. We, we wanted to give the superintendent um, that tool. Okay. That's how I understood it. Does that sound right to you, Sarah? Yeah. I, yeah, because I don't remember talking about any exceptional case or potential case. Uh, okay, so if that's the case, I just, I'm not sure because um, it refers to safety requirements of the policy and the exceptions being authorized by the board, I guess, is the last part. Um, it's, it's just that you're going to have to come to a board meeting, I guess, to make those exceptions. So I feel do that now, probably without having that in the policy. So, I think, Bryce, are you coming from exactly what Kelly was saying? They were trying to give it to the superintendent. Your question here is really why is it say authorized by the board? If, if, they, if, that, if that is indeed the, the intent, Bill, I will let you go ahead and speak. I know yeah, so, just is it is it a phrase or a sentence that says, you know, something along the lines of including but not limited to, and just throw a couple of examples in there of what would be an exceptional thing. And it, you 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 give yourself a little leeway there. You've kind of described what it is that would qualify. Mm -hmm. um, it, not only those things, but at least people have an understanding. I think Bryce is where you're going for like what what could be what could rise to the level of exceptional. You throw two or three examples in there, and you say not limited to those, but those could be some examples of it and you just you open yourself up there you give people a little bit more leeway to, to do what's right i mean i think we all trust sherry to do what's right um and the administration to do what's right in these situations so Mark, yeah. what bill is saying here and it's like I, I get it it's to there so i would say that it says um circumstances deemed to be exceptionally as long as all safety or final wait a second goes back up the superintendent shall have the authority to make exceptions to this policy under circumstances deemed to be exceptional as long as it, as long as all safety requirements are met. Cross out and the exceptions are authorized by the board. And then you're getting into personal stuff, I believe, and then we'll be going, because an exceptional thing could be a personal matter or it could be a physical challenge or something like that. And now- Right, and I, as, a, as, as the current superintendent, I, what what is deemed as exceptional? I, I mean, 
we are asked almost all the time daily, especially the year, yeah. to make exceptions to this policy. And I would really appreciate more guidance to what rises to that level. Um, because all of this is based on safety. Every element of this is about safety, primarily. And so for me to have guidance from the board about what is deemed as a, those examples, I think exactly as Bill was saying, would be extremely helpful. And as long as we can loop in a couple more exceptions and exceptionals and exceptionalese <laughs> into that sentence, I'm fine. <laughs> and make it acceptable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I guess I'll just to piggyback on what Sherry was just saying, right? A lot of this is about safety. Um, and then the other piece of it would be more financial, right? Those are kind of the two pieces. There's a safety aspect and there's a financial aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're saying we're throwing out the safety thing, then it's more based on do we want to make like a financial exception? It's kind of why. Like, but I take it. That's why I was in here. That's just that's just why I was asking if there's any ideas thrown around as to what other exception might be. Because that's the only thing that popped into my mind. Answer is no. I have a I have a question on the next paragraph. <laughs> that's something. <cool. laughs> <laughs> that was the only thing they added. That's that's the only, <laughs> well, it's already, no, we're voting now to adopt or not. So. Yeah. Um, the superintendent or designee will establish routes. Who's the designee? Um, and designate stops after considering both the safety of children efficiency. So this comes from me being a Killington representative and um, the board members had set the bus routes stops in Killington. We didn't come to the superintendent. Um, Killington for the middle school, high school, I believe only has four bus stops. See that I've gone one year from the school, <laughs> and um, I would sit in the school park in the bus parking lot, and parents would be complaining or whatever, and it worked fine for ten or twelve years. Roger Rivera and I, and we'd be like, it is not our obligation to get your kids to school; it's yours, and these are our bus stops, because we had something like thirty bus stops. And then since Pittsfield students were coming here, they were getting up at some ridiculous hour. And it's, so how many bus stops do they have now in Killington? Not for the elementary, for the high school. They have one. Yeah. No, one would be great. I mean, I, get, I have it right here, Jim. I yeah. Have some candy, Jim. So, <laughs> I'll get my sugar up. Well, actually, I brought, I brought that issue to the Finance Committee, and they are considering that. And based on the outcome of the Finance Committee, we will either continue where we are now, or we will go back and look at that again. I know we have a whole bunch of, and, and this is, I was, I was new to Vermont, too, in 1997 when I moved here. But, you know, when you take into consideration all the studies that we listen to as board members, of how a um, student um, brain works differently than um, an adult. And the later they get to sleep, the better for their learning. And you start throwing in 15, 20 bus stops, every single one of those bus stops is throwing another minute, two minutes onto the bus stop. And we were having kids being picked up at Pittsfield at six o'clock in the morning. So we can make both bus stops. I believe we made it so that the Pittsfield back two years ago, they were being picked up around 720 in Pittsfield. So an hour and 20 minutes difference. All right, let's get back to the, the motion on the floor, I guess. I guess so I guess so my, my ask, long story short, was hoping that there'd be some clarity. Um, in this language specifically before we did a final vote, but this is the final vote we voted last week. No, we could vote No, we can yeah. send it back. Well, exactly, that's what I'm saying. So we're voting to not hurt your feelings. Um, but that would be that would be my, my ask. But as it stands, we have a motion on the floor to approve it as is. Um, so I will just ask, do we have anyone opposed to the motion as it stands? I will right. say I will withdraw my motion. That makes it easier. I already asked. We're gonna do it. All right. We're gonna make, so so that means you need to, to roll call, unfortunately. So I'm gonna gonna try to shoot through names pretty quick. But when I say your name, if you could give a an I or an A, that would be great. Um, it, it, what are we voting on, real quick? What just to send it back to the committee or to approve it? 
to a vote. To, to the vote is to approve. To approve as it stands. Uh, Bob Crane. I'm in favor of it. We didn't uh, hear you. He's in favor. Uh, uh, Adam. What do horses say? <laughs> Nay. Yeah. Uh, Bill? Uh, I'll go with Bob on this one, yes. Gwen? Nay. Kelly? Aye. Ben? Nay. Anna? I'm going to say uh, nay, but thank you for your work. I look forward to saying a different thing next time. Uh, there you go, Sarah. Yes. She wants to be the. All right, how many is that? Should have been keeping track, I guess. Four yeses. Are you keeping track right now? I have one. You got Bill, Bob, and the two board members. And then we had Adam. Yeah, you don't need that candy. That's not this way. Gwen. <laughs> you can always yeah. nominate. Yeah, you know, can always nominate. So it's a tie. I'm getting a tie. Is there only nine of us here? Did I miss somebody? You didn't pull any of us. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't ask us. Thank you. Gary. Nay. 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 All right. Nays have it. So it's going to go back to policy. I'm sure you can be in line, guys. <laughs> this is hard. This being here some thing. That's why everybody should be here. All right. So I'll go back. Um, thank you guys very much, though, for that work. I'm sorry if I stood to talk too much, but yeah, I'm sure everyone else here will appreciate some clarity. Um, anything else from, from policy you wanted to speak about, Sarah? No. Um, anything more from buildings and grounds updates? We're good. We just need to make sure that uh, finance gets us another minimum of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, for the next fifteen years. And uh, you know, my term is up in two. So, but I will come back for the thirteen if I'm still around. <laughs> uh, uh, finance any other updates besides we brought the No, thanks. Sure. Uh, so uh, when we say there was the grounds for me, we do have Joe here. Oh, I, I don't run the place. It's, 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 you know, you have to let it fly. Really <laughs> cool. I mean, last uh, month we met at Harvard, and next month we'll be meeting at Ray. So I encourage people to come out and actually see these schools. Yeah. Because they're fun to see. Yeah. It's where your kids are being taught. Right, Carrie, do you have an update for us? Uh, yes, the configuration and, and enrollment working group will be um, officially convened very shortly. Um, a few of us met with the Tuck Business School group that's working to help us make some uh, proposals towards rebranding the name of Windsor Central Supervisory Union, and there's a couple of other use in there. Um, as well as we've been asked to consider a discussion around the, um, the mascot for Woodstock Union High School. Three students have stepped up to join us, and there are two to three board members on it, two administrators, and I have one alumni, and Bob Hager is going to present the request at the next alumni association meeting on November 9th, to hopefully get um, a couple of other people who are interested. It's an open group, so if people are interested in joining, um, I certainly would not turn down anyone. Uh, we need to have a lot of voices for the various groups that are in, interested in this to speak. So I don't want to put a limit on it and uh, keep it open for another few days, but Tuck would like to get back with this group, um, different pieces of the group in the next two weeks to continue conversations and get insights before they give a report to us. So, I have a question after that. Go ahead, Matt. Well, my, my question is, is uh, how, are, how is the, the current WASP name offensive to somebody that we would need to change it? I don't think that, that um, I, I can answer that short, briefly because it's come up in quite a few Facebook 
post that I've seen regarding the fact that WASP stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And okay. even though it's an insect as well, I think in these times, that's a conversation that's been brought forward. So that's what the consideration is. So my question, Carrie, was going to be, it says to change the mascot doesn't say to change the mascot is the mascot, the symbol, not the name. So I think, you know, like, it's, you'd still be the wasps, but I was wondering, well, what other, other than a B, what would you have? You know, so we're looking to change the school name of their mascot and the mascot. I, I really am not, I don't want to limit discussion on any of it. So no, I, that's what, when they said mascot, I was just like, with, for, you know, I, I understand what WASP stands for. So there's only two things in my mind. There's a, there's a, there's a wasp, the, the B, okay, or there's a white American, white Anglo-Saxon that I don't think we're going to use that drawing. No, so, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, no, I, that's what I'm getting at. So I'm just hoping that if, you're gonna, if, if we're talking about changing the actual mascot, oh, you know, then you're looking to change the name, and that might bring a whole different discussion into your conversation. Right. And I'm not going to ring in on it. Just so yeah, no, no. I, I, I believe that my role is to listen to all the people yeah. and the parties and hear what's being said, what's currently favored among the students, the alumni, the communities involved, and then come up with some proposals that we would bring forward. I don't expect it to be a fast decision, but the Tuck group is with us for a fairly short term time to kind of synthesize some of the thinking and give us some directions. Just once again, a mascot is the actual, you could be the New York Rangers and you could have a mascot, that's one thing, and you could still be the New York Rangers and you change your mascot. That's all I'm getting at. Yeah. Uh, Gwen? Gwen from the Raiders. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, okay. Uh, I just wanted to add that um, you should look into what I was told by a former principal of Woodstock um, that he was told that the uh, WASP actually was brought from Woodstock area sport program, sports programs, Woodstock area sports programs. And so I, you know, there's some people that have um, more to the history about this than, I, than I'm aware of, but I think that's something that we might want to look into to know where it actually originated from. That's just um, something I thought I'd add. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. All right. Thank you, Gary. All right. Uh, next up, consent agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So Second. 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 Anyone opposed to approving the consent agenda? All right, consent agenda passes. Um, next up, we'll have our second session of public comment before executive session. If any members of the public are here to say anything, now is your last chance this evening. Uh, as far as the directive, we still need executive session. There's no action after that, though. Okay, so just, just so the public's aware, I'd like to let you know there's no intended action after the executive session. Um, so you can still hang out if you'd like, but I'd just like to give you that heads up that there's still be no action afterwards. If you, if well, you they may want to hear our reflection. <laughs> that they might want to hear the reflection. Yes, that's true. <laughs> so any members of the public, if you could raise your... I mean, before we go into exactly. If you could raise your Zoom hand. And if not, looks like um, next up, I don't have the language in front of me, but we wanted to discuss uh, contracts. Oh, yeah. So I, I need a motion that discussing contracts in public would be detrimental to the district. So I'm with, can I have a second back in? Anybody disagree with that? 
And if not, can I get a motion to move into executive session to discuss contracts? So moved in 858, I believe. And if Jim wants to stay in, the judge can go and. We're going to invite anybody up over on Jim Fathead. All right, we're going to go into executive session. Jerry, so can you open up and get people to the way my computer died? Yeah, my dad. I'm going to have to go back into it. That's what I do. All right, so for those members of the public, if you'd like well, to hang on, we can get you into the waiting room. If you don't want to wait until after, you can just go ahead and leave. But thank you all for attending tonight. I appreciate it. We might have a great reflection. You got to get rid of it. No. Oh, sorry. Well, can I delete it on? Yeah, but I can do it on that as opposed to, why don't I just do it on that? Oh, careful, Bella. Yeah. This, this, this doesn't have privileges to kick people. Yeah, because it was open. Oh, it was, oh that's because it's in Joe's. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's why I said yeah, that's yeah. my plan. <laughs> Joe has no privileges. Am I using that? All right, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Hey, Raven, can you give Joe permission? Because she, she, okay. That was my question because everybody left and now there's no co hosts anymore. <laughs> yeah, the internet went down. I can't get on. All right, I'll give it to Joe. Yeah. Are we not responsible adults to host the party? <laughs> Speak right. for yourself. I feel like someone. I'm denying kicking me and out. And now, <laughs> and now he has the power. You see so. <laughs> Joe, we'll take you good so we get out of here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raina. <laughs> All right, I think we're clear, right? Are we not recording anymore? Not yeah, we are. We can record it during our Yeah, we are. 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 It's the longest meeting we've had in a while. I Kurt Peterson texts me, as a Proctor Academy alumni, I authorize you to borrow our name, the Hornets. You won't even have to change the logo. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, guys. Thank you to, uh, to lead here. Motion to adjourn, 931. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>